Hello, we're going to talk a little bit about where this expression right here comes from. Okay? And remember that centripetal acceleration is the acceleration an object has to experience if it's going in a circle. Okay? Something has to be changing its velocity's direction, even if you're keeping the magnitude of that velocity's that velocity constant. And the centripetal acceleration is the thing that does it. And I just plopped this down, kind of, you know, like an axiom in the last lecture, and said, okay, well, the units work out, and conceptually it checks out, right? You need more of an acceleration to change your velocity fast if you're going around a tight circle, so a low radius. And uh, you don't need to change it as fast if you have a high radius. And if you're going fi faster around a curve, well, then it makes sense that you would need more acceleration to keep you on that curve and keep you from flying off in some direction, okay? <clears throat> So, where does the form of this equation come from? And there's a lot of different arguments you can go to to uh, look into this. However, uh, I want to look at just, a, just, just this one. And you can go searching around if this sort of proof of this equation doesn't work for you. All right? So, first thing we want to do is look at two moments, as we often do, on the circle and the velocity has changed direction somewhat, and we form a little triangle here, right, between the two objects' positions initially and finally. Okay, and the question is, okay, well, first question, what, what is, what is, what is this side of the triangle equal to? Well, that's approximately going to be equal to the arc length that it traces out on the circle. You see that because I'm making it a triangle, and this isn't an arc, it's a straight line, that's not technically true, right? That's a, an approximation. But if we're just talking about two little snippets of time, I've exaggerated it here, but if you imagine like making initial and final really close together, like down here, well then the curved distance and the little straight line distance are even closer together, okay? So that we're going to call delta s. We usually call arc length s, and so we're going through some <coughs> change in position along the circle, so we'll call it delta s, okay? So that's our first triangle that we're going to deal with. The other triangle that we're going to deal with is one that we're going to form out of the velocity vectors, okay? So let's take a look at that. And what that looks like is this. So you'll note that I've taken this velocity vector right here, and I've preserved its direction. I've just blown it up in size a little bit so we can see it better and stuck it right there. And I've done the same thing with the final velocity, right? So the same magnitude, but different direction. And I've brought that over here and put it as that side. Again, preserving its direction, just blowing it up a bit so that uh, it's in proportion to the initial velocity. And so if we were to graph out, graph out what delta v, so final v minus initial v, looks like, it looks like this dark blue line here, labeled accordingly. Okay. And the trick here is to realize that if you go through some angle going from here to here in terms of your position on the circle, then the change in angle of your velocity vector is going to be the same thing, okay? That should make sense if you think about what a circle is, okay? But these are the same theta. Now, because of the same theta, we know, <clears throat> and that uh, the magnitudes of v0 and vf are the same, okay? Right, same speed, but different directions we have two similar triangles here regarding the position that the position of the article before and after uh, of the object rather uh, before and after this occurs right going from position one to position two and we have uh, a triangle formed of the velocity vectors initially and finally of this object okay they have the same angle they have two equal sides and if you remember back to ge geometry class, you know that similar triangles, you can relate the proportion of their sides. So let's see how that works out, okay? So this is the proportion of the sides, 
right? So delta v, the magnitude of delta v over the magnitude of those velocity vectors, okay? So the speed that we're maintaining going around the circle. That ratio on the right-hand side here is gonna be equal to the ratio of the sides of the triangle formed by our position vectors, okay? And that's gonna be delta s over r, relating the same kind of side as we are over here, okay? Once you make that realization, you can appeal to the definition of acceleration and solve for delta v here, right? So to go from here to here, all we've done is multiply both sides by the magnitude of the initial velocity and final velocity, right? That constant speed that we're maintaining. And so we end up with this expression. We substitute that in for delta v there, and let's see what we get. So we substitute that in, we get, uh, well, let's do it this way. So we have one over delta t, and then in the numerator, so multiplying that whole thing, is that v, v over r times delta s. And if we just group this a little bit creatively, so we leave v over r, and we put delta s over delta t. Well, what's delta s over delta t? Well, if you think about it, okay, so that's the distance along the circle that's being covered in some period of time. That's just the velocity again, or rather, the speed, the magnitude of the velocity. So this is just equal to v again. And so you end up with an expression for the magnitude of the acceleration that is v squared over r. Okay. Clever, huh? So if you were unconvinced by my conceptual hand-wavy arguments in previous, <laughs> previous lectures, both live and recorded, uh, this is a method you can use to prove to yourself that the centripetal acceleration, so the acceleration required to make an object move along circular arcs, is indeed, has a ma or rather, has a magnitude equal to v squared over r. All right? So hopefully this helped.